My name is Carl O'Connor. I'm the president of the Historic Society. Um, I'll do a presentation to give you an idea of what life was like in Enfield in 1914. I'll uh, give you a brief idea of what was going on in the world as well as in Enfield. And uh, we'll get started. Uh, the U.S. population in 1914 was 99 million. Uh, the Great War. began and uh, it was World War I, it wasn't called World War I until it was a World War II. Uh, President Woodrow Wilson declared USA neutral for three years, so nobody from the United States was involved in a war until 1917. Uh, President Wilson officially declared Mother's Day in 1914, and then women had the right to vote in 10 western states. Arizona, California, Colorado, Idaho, Kansas, Montana, Oregon, Utah, Washington, and Wyoming. But women in Connecticut did not have the right to vote until 1920, when the federal 19th Amendment was passed. What was interesting is there were columns in the infield press about suffrage all through 1914, and nothing ever happened in Connecticut. Uh, President Wilson's first wife died in August. Federal spending was $0.73 billion, or $730 million. Federal unemployment was 7.9%. The Panama Canal officially opened after 34 years of construction. It was 24 years of a French company, 10 years a U.S. company. It cost 27,000 workers their lives. Sailing between the east and west coast, it saves 8,000 miles and a trip around Cape Horn. Postal Service started using an auto to deliver mail. Life expectancy was for men 52 years, women 57. The average income was $577 a year. The, uh, Ford Motor Company raised wages from $2.40 for a nine hour day to $5 for an eight hour day. So for a year, that would be like $1,250. And then the average in the U.S. is $577. Ford sold 248,000 cars that year. Uh, the 65th Connecticut governor was Simeon E. Baldwin. In Washington, D.C., the first stone of the Lincoln Memorial was put in place. The world's first red and green traffic lights were installed in Cleveland. Traffic cones were invented by Charles Rude Baker. First items of stainless steel were available to the public. Mary Phillips Jacob patented the brassiere. Zippers were relatively new and used mostly in boots and tobacco pouches. The book Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs was first published. Charlie Chaplin made his film debut in a movie called Billy's Punctured Romance. <coughs> Babe Ruth made his major league baseball debut with the Boston Red Sox. Boston Braves swept the World Series over the Phillies A's 4-0, and they happened to play in Fenway Park. Wilson McCoy unleashes Gertie the Dinosaur, the first animated cartoon. In 1914, the U.S. Senate unanimously agreed to ban smoking in its chamber. Thomas Edison writes to Henry Ford on the health dangers of cigarettes. And I quote, I employ no person who smokes cigarettes. Henry Ford distributed tens of thousands of copies of Edison's letter to Michigan school children. It's 100 years later, now all of a sudden smoking's a big deal. 
The most frequent cause of death in Connecticut was pneumonia. John Hertz founded the Yellow Cab Company, taxi cabs in Chicago. Hertz later sold the business to concentrate on car rentals. I'm sure everybody's heard of Hertz Rental. 1914, the Mohawk Trail opens the cars as the first official scenic tourist route in New England. In Enfield, 1914, the population was 10,519 people. The town was run by town meetings. Selectmen administered town affairs between meetings. The first selectman in 1914 was a Mr. Cope, C-O-P-E. Services included the police department, Chief J.D. Callahan, four patrolmen, 20 supernumeraries or constables. 10,519. There were fire departments in Enfield, on Enfield Street in the Old Town Hall, and if you go to the museum, you can still see the shaft where they used to uh, hang uh, hoses to dry. There's also a fire department in Thompsonville, one in Asimo. And in 1914, the North Thompson Fire Department was founded. Additionally, there was town rubbish collection. Garbage collection was done by a local farmer to feed his hogs. Thompsonville had city sewers versus septic systems. And they probably didn't treat the water, and I'm sure it all got dumped in the Connecticut River. Well, Thompsonville and Hasville both had town water, electric streetlights, telephone, and electricity. And we're talking 100 years ago. The annual report for the town of Enfield for the fiscal year ended on August 31st, 1914. The total ex expenditures were $222,902. For schools, it was $41,000. They had 52 teachers and one superintendent. The free library budget was $1,646. The town farm was $1,400. What's interesting about the town farm is I always thought it was for people who were like poor or for uh, older people. In this annual report, they refer to the residents as inmates. There were 17 men aged 29 to 77, 10 women aged 4 weeks to 68 years old. Four people were sent to the town farm as sentenced after arrest. In 1915, six were sent to the town farm. <coughs> the uh, part. Where was that? Yeah, what street? It's on Town Farm Road in Enfield. <laughs> no, that, that's that's Town Farm. Uh, four people were sent. Well, okay. The annual report also lists insane poor sent to Connecticut Hospital for insane. There were 20 men and women, and it listed all the names of the people sent to the insane asylum. There was another category called poor away, which I think was like welfare or assistance. They also listed the names of the people who got this assistance. The uh, chief of police wrote a report on what his activity was in 1914, ended in August, fiscal year. He had 289 arrests, 130 were for drunkenness, uh, one was for trotting a horse on a bridge, overdriving a horse, refusing to send a child to school, an incorrigible boy. There were two charges of riding a bicycle on a sidewalk, keeping a licensed dog, barbering without a license. We had three people do that. Fishing with a net, four people arrested for that. Hunting game was one, and had a dynamite in possession. There were like 30 different charges, and those were, I thought, were some kind of the interesting one. And again, in the disposition, like 71 were sent to jail, 92 paid a fine, 14 were had this sentence suspended by court, and four were sent to the town farm. 
They also investigated 125 school absent complaints. Compared with 1914 and 2014, we have 99 police officers and they received 50,000 calls yearly for service. No information on that. I would think they were sent for like six months or a year, frankly. I just was surprised that they referred to the uh, residents as inmates. I really thought when I was a kid it was more a home for older men looking for a place to live. Scanning becomes Town Farm Road. Right. You go up the hill, you got the recycled uh, station. Yeah. It's on the left hand side going that way. This was on the right hand side. Uh, transportation in 1914, we had train, we had two lines, we had a Townsville line, and a Skinnical line. We had a trolley that went from Thompsonville to Springfield, Chickabee, also to Summers and to Warehouse Point. We also had automobile, motorcycle, these are all 1914 vehicles, bicycle, horse and wagon, and boat. In the home, for heating, coal and wood were used for, for the furnaces. Oil burners, furnaces for home use arrived in the 20s, so they weren't available in 1914. Cooking was the same thing, it would be either wood or coal stoves. Refrigeration, ice boxes were still in heavy use. The new electric refrigerators were little more than an ice box with a fan on top. Uh, washing machines, electric ones were new items. The older ones were hand crank or run with a gasoline engine. They also did preserving of food, cannon, homegrown fruits and vegetables, jams and jellies. 1914 prices. The new car cost $500. Again, the average income was $577. The new home, $3,500. Gallon of milk was 30 cents. Gallon of gas is 12 cents. Loaf of bread was 6 cents. Flour, 3 cents a pound. You can notice in the ad, you could buy 22 pounds of sugar for a dollar. Coffee was 30 cents a pound. A movie ticket cost 10 cents. For an adult, 5 cents for a child. First class stamp was 2 cents. And at Rich's Lunch, these are ads I actually got out of the press for 1914. A uh, regular dinner was 25 cents. Uh, you could buy a case of 24 bottles of cider from the Tivoli bottle works for 75 cents. Children's haircuts cost 10 cents. You can buy a hand lawnmower for three to three to eleven dollars. And the trolley fare had been six cents, they got it reduced to five cents. They had a lot of articles in the paper about they didn't want to be known as a six cent city. <laughs> and they had a lot of complaints and they finally agreed to reduce the price back to five cents. Yeah. The Thompsonville Press newspaper weekly costs three cents a copy. If you look at the, the ads for alcohol and whiskey a dollar a port, you can see why I have the press for probably for drunkenness. <laughs> Sorry, this little thing's got to stay there. <laughs> Businesses. There were in the food industry. There were four bakeries, two delis, twenty grocers, two fish markets, 
10 meats and provisions, 10 lunchrooms, 8 milk dealers, 10 confectioner and fruit dealers. There were 8 hardware stores, 8 dry goods stores, 18 clothing, millinery, and dressmakings. The people had a furniture, including ranges and undertaking. There were three businesses, J. Francis Burke, J. Hughes, and A. R. Lee. It's interesting that 100 years later, Brown and Lee are still in the undertaking business. That's the only business that I can positively say for sure after 100 years is still in business in town. J. Francis Brown. Oh, I didn't There was J. Hughes and A. R. Lee. Services, there was one bank, five insurance brokers, seven barbers, two hairdressers, four lawyers, three dentists, eight physicians, and two laundries. Also, <coughs> two photography studios. Um, this is typical of the pictures they had. We, we found these pictures in my mother-in-law's attic. This is a picture of a whiting. It was from that year. Von Ferro was the uh, company back then, and. In the studio, apparently, they like to use the centerpiece in a lot of the pictures because a lot of the pictures I've seen have the same setup. Uh, and again, it was upstairs in, in that grocery store. <laughs> there were two express companies, including Epstein, one ice dealer, there were five coal dealers, and probably also ice. Four newsrooms, 12 liquor dealers and bars or cafes, one florist, two jewelers, and one hotel. There's a bowling alley and casino hall on Central, and there were approximately 10 billiard or pool halls. The 1908 map shows the Infield Country Club off of Route 5 or Arioli's Dodges. I couldn't find any mention in the press or in the town directory of the country club. I don't know if there was one there and it, was, it happened after. And it may have been just a fantasy idea for someone to put a country club there in 1908. I couldn't validate whether or not it really existed in 1914. Uh, for department stores in, in Hartford, there was G. Fox, Brown Thompson, and Sage Allen. Springfield, we had Forbes Wallace and Steigers. They were all in business in 1914. And they would deliver to Winfield by truck. Sounds popular in 1914. The St. Louis Blues, Wall Street Rag, even had a song about at the Panama Canal. In addition, it's a long way to temporary, by the beautiful sea, ball in the jack, when you wore a tulip and I wore a big red rose, and Danny Boy. Dances, the waltz, and two-step are replacing the cotillion as a favorite American social dance. Periodicals. <clears throat> we had, uh, for newspapers, we had the Thompsonville Press, which was weekly, the Hartford Current, daily, Springfield Union was daily, and the Wall Street Journal was daily from Monday to Friday. Magazines, we had Vanity Fair, Good Housekeeping, these are covers from 1914. I think they look pretty sophisticated for 1914. Collier's, Photo Play Magazine, News Story Magazine, Scientific American, Designer, also Atlantic Monthly, Boy's Life, Popular Mechanics, Saturday Evening Post, Cosmopolitan, National Geographic, 
Ladies Home Journal, Home, and Harper's. Forms of personal communication. You had tele telegram, telephone, letter, Morse code on radio, couriers, and messengers. Radios had been around for decades, mostly using Morse code. Voice was developed, but really didn't become popular for broadcasting until after World War I in the 20s. Photographs were designed to place cylinders of discs, 78s that we all familiar with in our childhood, were introduced in 1931. In town, there were at least 23 fraternal organizations or societies. The Qantas Club, Britannia Lodge, the Brussels Athletic Club, Forever's Club, which I probably shouldn't have joined, uh, DAR, the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Infield Businessmen's Association, Fraternal Order of Orioles, Florence Nightingale Lodge, the Independent Order of Odd Fellows, the Grange, Companions of the Forest, GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, which are Civil War veterans. Then they had the Sons of GAR, Knights of Columbus, Knights of Pythias, the Pythian Sisters, Primrose Camp, Loyal Order of Moose, Masons, and that's the Masonic Lodge, the Republican Club, Women's Club of Enfield, Woodmen of the World who met at Forrester's Lodge, excuse me, Forrester's Hall, and the Society for the Detection of Thieves and Robbers. Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts have been founded in 1910 and 1912, but I found no record of either one in Enfield and anything I was able to read. We had 19 halls, including the Masonic Lodge. We had the Hazel Institute and the Old Town Hall. In addition, we had the Casino Hall, Brussels Hall, the Emmett Hall, Franklin, the uh, Hazard Hall Tavern, which was on Infield Street. No idea where that was. The Forrester Hall, Knights of Columbus Hall, St. Joseph's Hall, Apollo, Hasbro Hotel, the Athletic Hall, Busy B Hall, Music Hall, GAR Hall, Hot Fellows, and the Central Library Union Hall. Infield Public Schools published this report in the, uh, in the press. The total town, total, town total of students was 1,402. There were 690 boys and 712 girls. High school had 261 students, 112 boys and 149 girls. What's interesting, if you look at the high school, from freshmen, you show 132, Sophomores 72, juniors 27, seniors 30. Apparently high school was not the priority in 1914. Schools, we had 13 schoolhouses, including seven one-room schools. Infield High School, built in 1868 on North Main Street. They had tuition students from Suffield, East Windsor, and Summers attend through 1935. The 1914 graduating class was 25, 10 boys and 15 girls. We also had the North School, South School, and I believe they used the same blueprints for the South School as the North School, the same money. They had the Infield Street School, which is right in front of where the Infield Street School is now. Hagen School was built in 1914, later doubled in size, and it did the same idea. They had the blueprints, they used the same blueprints to double the size of the school. Oh, pardon me, it was named for a Harford carpet agent who provided land on which the school was built, Lady Higgins. We also had the Hazardell Grammar School, and anybody sees it now, there's like a two-story addition in the front of it, so it doesn't even look like the school but it is the same school. Skidiko School, at the Wallop School where we have our museum. There's a Wayman School. Additionally, there was a King Street School, j -Box School, East Wallop, which was on Fletcher Road, 
Shaker School, and the Bell School on Elm Street wasn't listed, but it was used. Probably the idea was to get rid of it when they opened up Higgins. But I think they used it for, like, overflow. Uh, there was one parochial school, St. Joseph's, which was affiliated with St. Patrick's Church. Other schools in town included the Vicari Institute for Typing and Shorthand on Windsor Street. The Brennan School Business School was on Mulligan Block. School of Music, Milton Arneson on 9, 144 Pearl Street. And the School for Dancing was a Casino Hall on Center Street. Prep School was Suffield Academy in Suffield was founded in 1833. It was a boys' boarding school, boarding prep school, and it did not go co ed until 1975. In town, in Thompsonville, we had seven churches, including St. Andrews, St. Patrick's, the Impial Congregational Church, the Catholic Apostolic Church which was located just where the entrance is now to go to Infield High School. It originally had been split off from the Infield Congregational Church. They had the North and South Churches. But apparently at some point they reunited. There was also the Methodist Church on High Street. The United Presbyterian Church, which is now the new neighborhood center, and I think the town just sold. It looks a lot nicer there than it does currently. And the First Presbyterian Church, which is behind the Civil War Monument, uh, that's where the Stella's Restaurant is now. In Hasbro, we had the uh, Methodist Church, St. Bernard's Catholic Church, and St. Mary's Episcopal Church. St. Adalbert's was not organized until 1915, and was built over 12 years. St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Church was organized in 1916, so they weren't around then. This isn't actually the Majestic Theater, but the movie theater in Enfield was the Majestic. I found out it was on, on as Nuntuck Street. They never had an address. So when I was looking through the council presses, I could never figure out what they were talking about until I saw an ad for a fruit dealer who opened up on, on, as, on as Nuntuck Street across from the Majestic. Uh, Dillon and Cook were the proprietors. Again, the admission was 10 cents for adults, 5 cents for children. Saturday night, children were 10 cents. They had silent films. They had vaudeville acts. They held professional plays. The Enfield High Dramatic Club presented a play in the spring of 1914, and the Enfield High graduation, class size of 25, 10 boys and 15 girls, was held in the Majestic Theater. Other theaters, the Oprium on Church Street, there was no ad in the press, and I could not find it listed in any of the business directories. I think it went out of business before 1914. Everybody's familiar with the Strand Theater. That didn't open until 1937. And Franklin Theater was after 1914. These are some of the movies that played in 1914, all silent films. Again, Charlie Chaplin's Tilly's Punctured Romance, The Patchwork Girl of Oz, The Squaw Man, The Pearls of Pauline, Wizard of Oz, Cinderella, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Mary Pickford, Pests of the Storm Country. If you notice in this ad in the bottom, Wednesday we will have a special three reel hand colored feature. Uh, everything was black and white unless someone took the time to paint each frame of the movie. And again, this isn't the real Majestic Theater, I just Got a couple of images off the internet to put some parameters around what, what I was showing. <coughs> manufacturing, primary manufacturing in Thompsonville was the Hartford Carpet Company. 
Employee count in 1910 was 2,900 employees. In 1914, the, car the Harvard Carpet Company merged with the Bigelow Carpet Company of Clinton, Mass., forming the Bigelow Hartford Carpet Company. In 1929, one month after the stock market crash, the Bigelow Hartford Carpet Company merged with Stephen Stanford and son of Amsterdam, New York, and created the Bigelow Stanford Carpet Company. So even 1914 was important to them, that's when it became the Bigelow Hartford. There was also the Upson Martin Carpet Works, competitor of Bigelow. The uh, Suffield Plate Company, which is still next to the tracks, made casket hardware, shrouds, and linings for uh, caskets. The uh, Bushnell the press company made heavy machinery from hydraulic presses to carpet loads. There was also a brickyard on Alden Avenue called Brewer and Best, and I didn't get any photographs of that. I think we finally found one of that last week in, in something Mike was looking at. It's the first picture I think I've seen of, of the brickyard. Dr. Vail had a sanitarium on Infield Street for the treatment of mental, alcohol, and drug problems. It's currently where the Parkway Pavilion nursing home is. In Hazardville, A.D. Bridges was a manufacturer of wooden products. It's where Kelly Fredette is now. And I couldn't find a picture of this, but there was a company that made the Hazard Lead Works, and on the bottom of this Enfield Echo, is the maker of Hazard Guaranteed Paints. They made lead paint. Now, if you think about somebody living in Hazardville for the 70 years prior to 1914, they wouldn't want to work for the powder works because there was a good chance of getting blown up. You probably would think working for the Hazard Lead Works was a safer thing to do. I'm not sure it was. We also uh, just skip one on me. In Skidico, we had the Gordon Brothers, Shoddy Mill. They were early recyclers of woolen rags. And in Somersville, there was the Somersville Manufacturing Company, which burned down three, four years ago. Farming in uh, this year, tobacco grown in Enfield peaked at 1,500 acres on 200 different farms. And also in 1914, we had an end of an era. The last six shakers in Enfield sold the remaining shaker property in 1914, and the last three shakers left Enfield three years later. So they'd been in Enfield some level of presence for 140 years, and it all ended really in 1914. If you wanted to go on a summer outing in Enfield, back then, Riverside Park was an option. You could have outings, clam bakes, an optional method of transportation was this riverboat. Uh, the dam was in place, and I'm sure the uh, the the water was more navigable back then. And I, I saw an article where one of the clubs was going to uh, Riverside for their uh, summer picnic, and they were going by boat. And I believe this boat was used for Riverside, so they could have been in that boat. Another option you had for, for summer outings would be to go to the Piney Ridge in East Windsor. It was a trolley park. You take a trolley to Warehouse Point, and take the Rockville Line to Pine Ridge. Pavilion, this shows a pavilion called Granger Hall. They had dancing, they had a ball field, and they had outdoor movies. Pretty much went out of business when the trolleys kind of went away. In 1914, things had happened. A footbridge was added to the south side of the Connecticut River Bridge. The Skidico Railroad Bridge over Skanek River was replaced Cast iron replaced a wooden structure. 
A new post office formerly opened at 48 Pearl Street in Mulligan Block. A.D. Hickens School was built on North Main Street with bricks from Brower and Best Brickyard on Alden Avenue. <coughs> Bless you. The Tompkins Wild West and Cooper and Whitby's European Circus was held June 5th in Thompsonville. Also, the Union Agricultural Society held its 76th annual cattle show and fair September 30th in Thompsonville. And the Pearl Street Library was built, funded by a $20,000 grant from the Carnegie Corporation. Andrew Connor Dee was a Scottish American industrialist who lived from 1835 to 1919. The Carnegie Corporation from 1888 to 1923 funded 1,687 public libraries in the USA and 108 academic libraries, like for, for colleges. The libraries are in 48 states, plus four in DC and one in Puerto Rico. There are none in Delaware or Alaska. Infield, uh, pardon me, Connecticut has 11 Carnegie public libraries, funded between 1901 and 1914. Total grants were $191,900. And overall, the Carnegie Library grants totaled $45 million. That pretty much ends what I wanted to present. I want to thank uh, Susan Lather, the uh, Infield Senior Center, for hosting us. I want to thank Mike Miller for sharing his Infield images with me. And the Central Library for use of the, uh, the 1914 Thompsonville Press microphone. Upcoming events, the uh, library next Thursday is going to have a Carnegie reenactor at this Pearl Street Library, I believe, from 6 to 8 p.m. And the Enfield Historic Society, our next regular <coughs> meeting will be Monday, October 27th. It will be about Civil War cooking. And we hold our meetings usually at the Enfield American Baptist Church at 129 Post Office Road. <coughs> that ends what I wanted to present. about history, science, politic, politics, religion, and more. The greatest works of literature were there for everyone, free. How many lives were changed by this one small library? 100 years later, the world has changed and the library has changed with it. Services aren't limited to books and newspapers anymore. Electronic media like DVDs and access to the internet are as important as books. But something hasn't changed. The Pearl Street Library is still opening up worlds and changing people's lives. In honor of our treasured library centennial and its 100 years of service to the community, the Enfield Historical Society presents, and I'm going to lift it in a second, this framed copy of the original Pearl Street Library plans and copies of all eight sheets of 1914 plans to the Pearl Street Library.
Thank <laughs> you.